Amazing to have you here, mate. <laughs> Good to see you. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a bit of a fan of your work. Uh, the whole reason, the whole reason I wanted to get you on, um, you actually instigated this series for me. I'm not going to lie, because I am fascinated by drawing. Obviously, I do a lot of drawing myself, but it was when I saw your drawings that I was, I was, I was a bit kind of confused as to how you were doing them so high quality but so consistently um, and I know you've already said to me that it's not as you know crazy or complicated as it sounds so hopefully today will be a really good and useful uh, video for people who follow you who are following me they're interested in understanding drawing and doing unique architectural drawings um, so without further ado um, introduce yourself in kind of a short way and just tell us a little bit about yourself what you're doing and then we'll get straight into your into your drawings right um thank you for inviting me here it's awesome <laughs> no problem man so i went to i mean i'm right now studying at harvard graduate school of design doing masters in architecture i'm in my final semester and before that i went to uh, southern california institute of architecture which is sciarc and uh, it's a really formal and experimental school, and that's what where I really develop these kinds of uh, formal techniques in exploring uh, ideas and like expressing concept through form, things like that. Right. So you're still at university, and you're you're producing these drawings as part of your course, right? So this is all no. related. <laughs> this has got nothing to do with your your university course at the moment. Not at all. Like this is wow. something very personal. It's uh, it's a more like a self motivated thing, and I just started doing this because um, I took a some uh, I, I took a studio with uh, Max Goggin, who's a professor at Harvard, and he did a studio about self discovery. So he just teaches us why we like why we might be doing what we're doing right now and what we're interested in, how that might have developed uh, from the experiences we had as young architects, I would say, you know, young designers to, ins being inspired from different things. So uh, after that semester, the pandemic hit, right? So um, we had nothing to do. We had no job, you know, nowhere to go. So I was just stuck in my apartment, just thinking about what I learned from that studio. And I started developing these kinds of series uh, drawings that might really kind of document my thought process as uh, design methods. The thing about your drawings for me is, I I absolutely love the play on shadows, the play on light, but the concept of the fact that they are anomalies. And I love the fact that it's just very simple because if people don't already know, your you know, nearly every single drawing you've been putting out from this series is going viral. Uh, it's going a little bit viral because it's always trending on the explore page for me. And, you know, I know quite a lot about Instagram, so I can tell from you know the the likes and t tell from you know your profile that they are trending posts, um, and I think it's amazing. I think you've also cracked the Instagram algorithm mm -hmm. <laughs> by producing. You're a right. Series. You're right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, the, I just I love the quality of your drawings, the black and white theme, uh, the granular texture, um, and as I understand, you use V-Ray, right? Yes. Um, I've. I've been only using V-Ray. I'm, I to be, to be fair with you, I'm really not a representation person. I'm actually terrible at it, and uh, uh, I I just thought that the best way to show these idea is to be literal as possible, without any kind of drawing technique that might alter its form or reading of it. So, so that's why I'm using like the default material with like that uh, that juxtaposes with one another material, which is concrete, that. Uh, that is used when I want to uh, kind of show heaviness, like weight, or some sort of um, like a stereotomic uh, approach to design. And uh, shadow is really Sorry, what something was that, word? that I... Stereotomic. Stereotomic. Uh, okay. Could mm -hmm. you explain that yeah. word a bit? So stereotomic uh, architecture describes a kind of uh, a heavy, heavy, solid form that has been carved away with specific geometry. So it's, it's kind of like a cave. Uh, you would have a box with like Boolean difference operation or like a carving uh, of some sort of figure, but you still see the edges of the box so that you perceive it as a box that has been carved in a certain way. Yeah. So I think when I'm doing those things, I, I, I definitely want to use concrete. So I brought that one additional material in 
but I do not want to be like using colors or you know uh, fancy materials like wood or brick. I, I I try to avoid it just so that it's like the simplest representation possible. And as for the lighting, I, I'm I'm re- I'm actually interested that you're you're interested in the lighting, but to me, I think it's just there for me. It's just really there to um, give it um, kind of depth to the drawing. I would say I I, I don't really like um, drawings without light. I think the shadow plays a quite a big part. I guess like what what yeah. So I think those are just really simple, essential components of the drawing. Yeah, uh, amazing. I think we could probably do a deep, deep episode talking about the you know the, the the philosophy behind a lot of this stuff. But the whole point of this video is hopefully to give the viewers um, some tips, some insight into how you produce these kinds of drawings. Um, so without further ado, uh, if you could sh- jump into the slideshow or something, I named this. <laughs> AA67. This was the 67th uh, architecture. Anomaly. I mean, come on. That is sexy. <laughs> that is AA sexy, not AA67. I mean, you must be yeah. proud of that, right? The, I, I really like this one. And this one did go viral on the internet as well. <laughs> um, first of all, I was just uh, interested in the kind of uh, manipulation of the ground and how architecture can operate in, within the system of grid repetition and um, kind of a rigid form, primitive form, which is represented with the box, with the grid. And I was thinking about the ground in architecture to operate independently from architecture. So it is autonomous in a way and how that might interact with the architecture in a different way. So this was a really simple illustration of what that might be. I This is not a project. None of my anomaly is a project. So they are just ideas and this is something I really brought into the next level uh, from this studio I took uh, at the GSD with uh, Camilo Restrepo. He's an architect from Colombia. And um, we did this topic of ground scraper. So it's a long, horizontal, narrow building. Not tall, like a skyscraper put horizontally. So he calls it gr- the ground scraper typology. So I was experimenting that through the idea of the, the kind of autonomous ground versus the constant form of architecture. Wow, so that curved thing that's kind of interlacing itself with the, the building, that's a kind of um, an abstract take, a kind of artistic take on, on the ground becoming part exactly. of the architecture. Exactly. I never even knew that, and that's, that makes the drawing even better. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't I really don't want to say that uh, this is a drawing technique that's new or you know radical or like a uh, advanced uh, that requires advanced technique. I, I think it's really simple, but it's just effective in presenting ideas that might be radical. Yeah. Right. The thing is, this is the, the value I really want to kind of uh, extrapolate from you is uh, your way of approaching a design idea through your preferred medium and I think you've obviously cracked down on a really beautiful way of expressing your design ideas and hopefully the viewers can take away uh, some ideas of how to do drawings of their own whether they're in university or whether they're in the profession the whole point of these series is to get in incredible designers and illustrators like yourself and and share some ideas that will inspire people so tell us a little bit about the process of how this was created so I'm just going to walk you through like the really, this is the file that I really used uh, to create this model and the rendering. So it was really simple. I I just do sketches of very simple geometry, how they might, like how the two things might interact. Initially, I had this little peak mountain. It's really, really simple. And uh, I I use uh, a lot of techniques that give you like a smooth surface, like fillet edge on Rhino. I'm sure a lot of people know that already. So um, I'm using the kind of really simple techniques to achieve these kinds of curves. A lot of people ask me, well, how do I create these curves? It's really not that difficult. It's you just put in the number and you're able to get different kinds of radius and different surfaces. And sorry. As such, it's really simple. And it gives you like this continuous surface that might seem to oscillate instead of being broken down. So it, it's, it's a technique that's co- uh, commonly used throughout all of my anomalies. I like to imagine things being continuous and kind of reduced down to a single entity. 
I think that's also key to uh, some of my anomalies. And um, the, the way I would render it, uh, I, I have this plane on the background that is, uh, that is initially a bronze material, but I, it, it gives a really nice kind of softened uh, reflection at the bottom. So I chose, I was experimenting with this earlier uh, in, in the process. Uh, and this was the kind of result that I wanted. Essentially, this has to look like an object, not not being in a context of a city or somewhere. This this needs to uh, pre exist independently from what it, from the world we have today. So, so the, the 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 kind of ground is there so that I can get the reflection and also the shadow. So you can see parts of the shadow not being too dark. I, I just liked it having a really light kind of um, kind of uh, presence to the drawing a little bit. Just to give give an idea what what it is uh, that's being sh uh, being uh, sheltered and what it is that's being shown. Amazing. Yeah. So, so let's let's jump back in the in the model. Um, mm -hmm. Let's have a little explore of those of those kind of uh, iterations that led up to the final one. It, it's really quite a simple simple exercise. Then, so essentially, you had an idea that became the catalyst for the whole design, right? Which was this kind of arched uh, kind of almost you know, you, the, the idea of the ground interlacing with the architecture, that was your initial thought, right? Mm -hmm. And then you just took that as a basic shape or as a basic mass. And then you thought about how the ground could inter interact with a, a basic architectural element. And that's where your kind of, um, you know, looks like a very modern kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> levitating uh, residential design, like a Louis Kahn type thing, maybe right. uh, kind of sitting there uh, as, as a, you know, there's, your work is beautiful, but the masses and the components you're using are very simple. Exactly. Um, I, I do not like 3D curve, to be fair with you. <laughs> 3D curve, first of all, it's really difficult to control. And uh, I only use it when I want to represent something that is soft or something that's um, uh, kind of landscape-like. That's the only times I would use uh, 3D curves. The rest, I would like to think about uh, the simplest architectural uh, terms like a surface or a grid or a volume. So, so essentially this, this two pieces, it's an it's a interaction between a grid and a surface and a surface that deviates from its original plane, oscillating in order to interact with the architecture. And I, I also think that uh, I, I gave it a concrete form, a so-called this concrete texture, just because it also expresses structure. And I think um, just to just to go back to the rendering, I think the the choices of material as well, like uh, how how I'm thinking about the ground is not something that just interacts with the building. It's also helping the building uh, stand up without any columns and underneath. So that 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 th those kinds of really simple ideas come into me, and uh, you know that that determines how how I might uh, model this uh, this kind of you know, a uh, op Boolean operation. I, I had to carve out, for example, uh, these two these these two squares, just so that this this piece can look like it can support this uh, structure. Right, that's really interesting. So the way in which you kind of created that void between uh, in your curve was by just placing a uh, a mass in there and doing the Boolean difference. Exactly. This is quite simple. I'm just gonna show it real, real quick. Uh, I just take the boundary of this two uh, box, sorry, so the planes, which is the floor slab and the ceiling, and I would intersect with the ground, and I would have these uh, lines, and I would use those lines to create a bounding box. So when I create this bounding box, I have a perfectly, you know, um, perfect square that aligns to the shape of these uh, two planes. And I would offset them, offset surface. And I have a slightly larger box that might uh, suggest that it's a little loose fit between the surface and the grid. So, but I'm just gonna move the bottom part up just so that it looks like it can sit on the floor. Sorry, too high, <laughs> my bad. Move face. Nice. Yeah. And I would just use that to Boolean difference. And I have a slightly larger hole. 
so that in the drawing I'm able to show oh god I pressed on Rhino but um, I'm able to show the kind of you know like slightly loose but at the same time at the bottom it's fitting exactly it's sitting on it so I think those are little uh, tiny details that I'm really interested in that's this is this is amazing I, I haven't stopped grinning because uh, <laughs> like I said I'm a bit of a fan uh, of these of these drawings and then now being able to actually look at the way in which it was produced and then kind of I'm in awe of the simplicity uh, but then I feel most most you know the most beautiful things are very simple um, I, it'd be really interesting to kind of see the initial sketches um, because I think the initial sketches oh <laughs> probably that that's the starting point and I think a lot of people try to go straight into 3D modeling uh, and they miss out the really crucial process of just being playful in, on a, in a sketchbook. You're, you're absolutely right. I think there are a lot of, uh, like personally, I've seen a lot of um, students at SciArc um, because it's a really technology-driven school. Uh, a lot of students are just going straight into Rhino, start modeling something really cool and like, you know, good looking. But I, I really do find big value in sketching. I, I know that you, you have really great sketches. I've seen your uh, Instagram posts and they're really amazing. I'm not a great uh, artist, really. My well, sketches you. are Let's find extremely... Out. <laughs> I'm so, telling you, really, you might be... I'm actually really ashamed to show this anywhere. But so are I you kidding? You Look, at your work. <laughs> Look at your work here, mate. Uh, if you stop the screen share, we'll be able to see the camera better. Sorry, let me, I have to find it. I, I don't know where. Thing is, I love seeing rough sketches. I love doing really, really rough sketches. And oh I, I have a few pet peeves. And one of them is when people say, I, I sketch really badly. So I, I, don't, mm. I don't agree with, with, with what you're saying, but let's see what you got. <laughs> really, I, I'm serious. <laughs> no joking. <laughs> I'm looking for it right now. Sorry, it might take a while. I sketch a lot. Sometimes I sketch something and I would model something totally different, but related, you know? So it might be a very different version. I'm not quite sure. There you go. <laughs> keep it right keep here. It. Oh, beautiful. So this is amazing. So what I'm, I'm gonna just read your sketchbook um, mm -hmm. and interpret. So I can see those that very first initial sketch, you've just done almost like a section diagram or like an elevation. Really, mm -hmm. that's the initial thought coming into your head where you've got this kind of ground plane. You're showing a very mm -hmm. basic mass on top. You're starting to then manipulate and show these waves coming up from the floor. And I exactly. absolutely, this is like, uh, as you, you're, you guys in America say, this is candy to my eyes. Because <laughs> uh, uh, then you're starting to develop that diagram and then that diagram starts to explore. I love the ones just below the main one uh, at the top because you're... you're no, these two ones at the top, the really oh, initial one. ones. Yeah, because they're, they're, mm -hmm. there you've actually said, wait, what if the mass goes up and sits on the surface? Or what right, if the surface right. then actually interlaces through it? I love that because th this is called thinking through design or thinking mm -hmm. through drawing. And for mm -hmm. me, you know, even my Instagram page is all about thinking through drawing. So, yeah, this is exciting me a lot. Um, <laughs> what can you tell us about these sketches? Right, so I, it was really like the two words, like the constant versus uh, autonomous. There, there's always a desire for architecture to float. You know, if we look at like Mies van der Rohe or, uh, you know, Coop Himmelblau, I think uh, we, we, have, we, we have this fascination about levitating form, but I, I'm not so interested in levitating form that is Zaha-like. I like levitating form that is simpler kind of like um, Mises' uh, Farnsworth house, which is just a box that just, that's just floating in the air. And I thought that um, if the ground starts to uh, kind of replace the columns that comes down all the way to the ground, uh, the, if, the, if the ground are able to, ground is able to manipulate itself, give, ha, it kind of uh, operate independently from the building in order to levitate, the, help levitate the building. I, I just had that initial thought and that became a studio project, uh, you know, be, uh, after this, this kind of digital sketch that I did as part Amazing. of the Anomaly series. Amazing. And uh, did you have any uh, slides to show of the other drawings or was that the one, only one? Uh, yes, I'm, I, I can show you a quick slight uh, show of the uh, 
the project that led from from this sketch. Oh, brilliant! Please. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Amazing. So this is a studio project from the GSD. Uh, my instructor was um, from Colombia, uh, Camilo Restrepo. He's the he's the principal at Agenda Architecture, and he was. Uh, he, he came out with this topic called the ground scraper. It's one of the reasons why my sketch, I had the longer version of it. Like the building was super long and the ground starts to manipulate and kind of support it, uh, uh, help, help levitate the building. So uh, it was very lucky that I had that sketch a week before I started this studio. So I had this thing going. I'm like, okay, I should explore the ground versus architecture. So it, it, this was the start of my journey. And we looked at precedents like this. Uh, this is uh, Craig Elwood's uh, Art Center College of Design uh, located in Pasadena, California. And this is also the same concept where the, the, the kind of building is operating with the system of grid repetition. And it's, it's just sitting there acting as the horizon within the terrain. So even if the mountain is going up and down, the building does not change. It, it, it remains as this constant uh, that that does not conform to, that's not that's not conform to the terrain. So these are other images of that project. It's an absolutely beautiful project. It's like a bridge in the middle of a kind of a landscape. So, and we talked about uh, the kind of inspiration from that and comparing the diagram to other architects who have dealt with the ground versus architecture. So this is bees right here trying to float. And there are other architects who try to either merge the ground to architecture or to separate them completely. And I was more in interested in the separation of ground and architecture. So I, I uh, so, this is Craig Elwood right here. Yes, go ahead. So these are your diagrams? Yes, uh, these, these are documentation. Just to give credit but you to- But you drew Pete. these diagrams on Illustrator yes, or yes. something? Uh, yeah, these are from Rhino and done in, uh, yeah, Illustrator. <laughs> nice. Yeah, just credits to Peter Trumer who came up with the four, the, uh, but I drew it over him. So the rest, I just had more uh, options to kind of further investigate this idea. And um, so these are some of the initial diagram and thoughts. So if I'm bringing the ground level down here, the ground can be perceived as a supporting element that spontaneously kind of raised from the floor. And the site was in Medellin, Colombia. Uh, it, it was a long site, obviously. It was like a 300 meter plot. So it's almost like the scale of like many, many buildings combined together. But we were given this kind of um, large plot just to have the ground, scrape, ground scraper intervene. And first manipulation of the ground and thinking about the relationship in the context, how I might relate certain things. I wouldn't elaborate too much. I kind of removed those slides just to quickly get you through what I was intending to do. And then this giant uh, courtyard uh, bar that sits on top of the landscape. So the manipulated ground is essentially the structure and also the connector. And the cores that might come in. So this is the, this is the overall kind of the thought. So it, as you can see, uh, my representation is super simple. I'm using this you know, white default rendering and concrete at the bottom. So these are my, my personal technique to representing really simple ideas in a very you know, um, very um, radical way. What I love so about this is it could, it could literally, these are things that could, they could very simply be sketches in your sketchbook. But the amazing thing that I think uh, sometimes people overlook is if you take a very simple sketch and try to represent it in a slightly different medium, you can end up with something quite remarkable. Um, mm -hmm. I think some mm -hmm. people would probably stop at doing a diagram, you know, a pencil or a pen diagram in a sketchbook of what you're showing here, which is a kind of a groundscaper block sitting on top of a undulating kind of surface with uh, kind of circumferences below, giving mm -hmm. some idea of you know the, the radius of of the you know of the curve and how that exactly. interacts with the ground plane. That could easily mm -hmm. be just a sketch, but you've gone one step further with your representation. Uh, and mm. to represent your thoughts through drawing in a beautiful way. And that's really inspiring. Thank you. I, I, I do think that it's quite an interesting way to 
uh, you, you're right. This is digital sketch. I think this is something that we need to understand that when we, when we draw sketches on on our uh, sketchbooks, <laughs> you know, it, it, it may appear really simple and kind of banal. But once it's translated digitally, I think there are other beauties that you might find from the concept of sketches. So I, I do consider this as sketch. This is not like a, you know, this is not like a final production drawing or I, I don't see it that way. I really think that this this is kind of the, the sketch we should be doing early on in the design phase. Yeah, Definitely. just to yeah, like quickly uh, go through it. Um, you know, there are programs of multiple. And one of the benefit of doing a ground scraper with a bu big building, it should be able to accommodate uh, different, you know, uh, programs of different sizes. So we had we talked about kind of the ground being manipulated to contain different programs of different sizes, and and towards the top, it it's much more rep repetitive. So they would have uh, contain uh, residential housing above. And these are some modular housing that we uh, introduced and some of the facade techniques that uh, just, just came out kind of last minute. So I'm not, I'm not going to talk about this too much, but um, yeah, like just to add on to the, to the visual effects as a, as a, the ground being the supporter. So I wanted to add the kind of incremental weight. So the facade is helping to do that. And uh, this is the overall uh, final elevation of the project where uh, it's, there's a composition of the structure, the, the ground, the activities that might take place, and the landscape that kind of oscillates through the site. That's beautiful. I love this. Like I said, I mean, sorry. Go ahead. No, I, I, I like I said, I'm, I'm really, you know, really tr trying to be simple with my representation. In this studio, it was a requirement to do black and white drawings and <laughs> only col color for uh, renderings. Yeah. So, but it it was kind of a advantage, a big advantage to me because I I really love uh the kind of you know uh, um the black and white representation that might take away the extra information. So it, like seeing the purity of the thing, I think it's quite beautiful. Definitely. Oh, I completely agree. I was gonna say I I I love the simplicity of it. I I think as you know on my on my profile, I'm constantly you know using black and white and just mm -hmm. plain line details, but I have been experimenting with color as well. And I think what you say mm. is, is very right. You know, when you bring in color, there, th there's a level of intentionality that you want to uh, kind of uh, bring in with color and what it represents and how you're using it to represent your ideas. Once you take away the color, you're left with the purest form, the purest, you're, you're, not, you're, you're trying to make people focus on something. So even exactly. in architectural representation or illustration, you know, the use of color and the lack of color are very intentional things. And that can really help you think about the way you draw. Right. I absolutely agree. I think there's also a, like it, it, it's completely different reading to a project when it's a color versus black and white. I think I, I really like to think about the thing in itself without like the nuances and the, the other specificity that brings in uh, with materials. So if I were to define just uh, that drawing that we saw just now, sorry, um, this one, if I were to put a brick pattern there, it's predefined. I, I, I would like to think of this as something that is, that is, a, that is a potential instead of something that's specific. Yeah. So I completely agree with you. That's such a profound point. Uh, I love the way you put that. Once yeah. you bring in bricks or once you bring in, uh, you know, kind of recognizable elements you're mm. you're then you're you're then making a statement of uh, of symbolism you're then making something recognizable and therefore it's 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 hard to summarize i think the way you put it was really 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 good it's as if when you just want to portray a thought or just want to portray a a thinking mm -hmm keeping recognizable elements out of there, including, you know, color, which starts to talk about specific, specific specificities, yeah. uh, can, can allow the person who is kind of viewing your drawing to imagine more, to exactly. kind of place your idea in their own reality. Exactly. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think it's really beautiful that we keep things uh, not defined, 
not too defined, at least in the early stage. I think it's it's okay to start defining things. And I think eventually when we practice, it's definitely an important part of the, you know, <laughs> the process. Defining things, I think it's definitely important. But um, I think at least in the design phase, I think it's really beautiful to have things not so specific so that we have more room for different types of uh, different kinds of interpretation. So, you know, like it used to be a thick bar that looks heavy, but eventually I had to, you know, give it a facade, give it like uh, kind of levels that kind of give it a specific scale and kind of function. So, yeah, I think uh, this, is, this is quite important to everyone who's designing. Amazing. So um, if you just pause the screen, uh, take the screen share away. Yep. Um, it's been an amazing session with you. Uh, I like to keep things kind of quick and easy to absorb for the viewers as well. So I think there's an amazing insights in there that everyone can take away with them um, and hopefully some tips as well. But could you give us some explicit tips, uh, perhaps a top <laughs> tip uh, for people? I mean, I'll make this a bit easier for you. What would be your advice or perhaps your top tip for people who are on their architectural journey uh, in university, in architecture school, and they want to take their drawings to the next level. They're, they want to be inspired. They want to uh, figure out a way to almost find their own style or find their own mm. passion when it comes to drawing. Um, or is it even, is it a fallacy to think that you should have a style at this stage? Mm. I, I mean, I think it's <laughs> definitely a difficult question to answer because I don't know if I have like a, a a trick that you know gives me the kind of works that I produce right now, but I do uh, I do think that I always say this like I I think that concept is a kind of uh, rationalizing your personal interest. So I think the kind of style, the color of someone, it comes from your interest of other things, not not just architecture, but interest of you, you in general. So I, I do think that it's really important to understand yourself. That's, I think, number one. And also, um, um, don't be too comfortable with uh, where you are. I, I, I always say this, uh, don't settle on your first iteration of design. I don't think that's a good way to design. So that's definitely a, something I would like to tell everyone uh, and, um, um it's really, it's really worth exploring what a single idea multiple times in order to really achieve what you want. So I think it's really, really important to not be comfortable with the first design you do. Yeah. That's amazing advice. And I'll be honest with you. You said that in our clubhouse discussion and I listened, amazing. I listened to it <laughs> and I acted on it and it's true. Really? You did? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I think I'll tell you something because I disagreed with it when you first said it. But then I was like, you know what? Mm -hmm. Before I disagree with it, let me try it. And I have been because mm. I work, uh, you know, I work. I practice as a as a, a partner and part part two architect in uh, Make in London. So you know, when we're coming up with our design iterations, and I'm not even joking. Even when you're thinking about the way you're presenting stuff or laying out a page, the first iteration, I I had this idea that the first iteration is the purest iteration and it's where mm, 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 it's mm. the closest thing to your initial thought. But there's that in of itself is such a deep topic. I'm, I'm sure mm -hmm. we could unpick that. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think, think so. generally speaking, what you say is so potent in that you can't be stuck on your first iteration. You have to keep defining it because that's the chiseling away. That's the kind of stereotropic thing you mentioned, right? You're almost... Uh, stereotomic, yeah. Stereotomic. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of stereotomic concept you were talking about, right? Where mm -hmm. you're kind of carving away at this final sculpture in a way. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Awesome. I man. think, yeah, I think um, I, I do agree with you. I think there is some sort of purity. Like, I, I also believe in like the first instinct. I think the first iteration gives you a general approach to a design, but the more specific thoughts you uh, kind of bring into your first iteration, I don't think it works as well as your third or fourth trial of the same iteration. Right. So I'm not saying that it's completely different that you do like, uh, you know, like 
the first scheme, I want to do this idea. And then second scheme, I should try a different idea. I don't, I'm not saying that. I think you should stick to one idea, but come out with many iterations of it. And your first instinct, like you said, it's the purest and the most important. I do think that that's something you should stick to. Yeah. So it's almost so like I agree the first, with you. <laughs> it's almost like the first iteration is the most honest. Yeah. But the last <laughs> or the or the penultimate or the ones after the, the, the later iterations are the most beautiful. So keep going. I think so. Yeah, I think so. Amazing. So, yeah, it's been an absolute <laughs> pleasure. Uh, I'm sure we'll be talking to each other more. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Awesome. Um, quickly, uh, let people know where they can find your work and let them know what you've got going on. Oh, I'm uh, my Instagram Saul underscore Kim underscore. It's quite easy to find. I'm posting most of my stuff there, whether it's Anomaly or IGTV podcasts. And um, I've been doing that quite uh, inconsistently. So please don't look forward to it, but look forward to my anomalies. Thank you. Beautiful. Thanks so much. Thank All you. Right.